Um, welcome. Good morning. My name is Stephanie Gilson. I'm Dakota Midwakatan Sioux from Minnesota Macans. I'm one of the fourth year psychiatry residents here at Yale, one of the co-founders of this conference. I'm currently residing on Poscott and Quinnipiac land. Welcome everyone to the second day of our second annual women's mental health conference. Just wanted to make um, one quick announcement before we get started. If you um, would be able to, if you went to the repro psych panel yesterday and you did not get CME, you have about 24 hours to, to submit your code um, and it should work. And um, I'm really excited to continue this journey with you all. We have a, a full day of um, presentations and I'm really excited to start the day off with an indigenous discussion. Um, and we have some a couple other indigenous speakers throughout the day. Um, Justice Deer, um, who's here to talk with us today, um, not just about missing and murdered Indigenous women, but also sexual violence, um, IPV that we experience in our Indigenous communities. This is very near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, I think as Indigenous people, um, and as Professor Deer talks about in her book, you know, when we're speaking about to indigenous women, you know, a lot of times this, the, you know, we frame it in in when, not necessarily if, when we're when we're talking about talking to our, our young women, and so this this conversation I think is really timely. Uh, I was really lucky to, um, you know, live in an indigenous, um, you know, in Minnesota we have a lot of indigenous communities, and I went to medical school in in Minnesota where we really focus our training on. Uh, educating um, the next uh, Indigenous doctors, but also taking care of our communities. But as a psychiatry trainee, I can say that the only conversation I have had um, about in indigeneity uh, throughout my training is actually with uh, Dr. Iva Graywolf, who'll be speaking later this afternoon. And, and to be honest with you, we and we and the, some other trainees invited her here. Um, so this really represents more of a, a global issue of Indigenous erasure. Um, which we, I think we'll get into a little bit today. Um, Justice Deere and I have no disclosures and I just wanna really thank the Native American Cultural Center at Yale who sponsored this session today. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate your support. And I will just start us off briefly um, telling everyone a little bit about uh, Justice Deere. She is a dis uh, university distinguished professor at the University of Kansas and a chief justice for the Prairie Island Indian Community Court of Appeals. Her legal scholarship focuses on the challenges facing tribal nations in the United States, particularly criminal justice. Her 2015 book, The Beginning and End of Rape, Confronting Sexual Violence in Native America, is the accumulation of over 25 years of working with survivors and the criminal justice personnel and has received several awards, including the Best First Book Award from the Native American Indigenous Studies Association. As a tribal jurist and scholar, Justice Deer scholarship focuses on the intersection of federal Indian law and victims' rights. Using indigenous principles as a framework, Deer is also a co-author of four textbooks on tribal law and has been published in a wide variety of law journals, including the Harvard Journal of Law and Gender and the Yale Journal of Law and Feminism and the Columbian Journal of Gender and Law. Her efforts to address criminal justice reform on Indian reservations have received national awards from the American Bar Association and the Department of Justice. She has testified before Congress on four occasions regarding violence against Native women and was appointed Attorney General by Attorney General Eric Holder to chair a federal advisory committee on sexual violence in Indian country. Justice Deer was named a MacArthur Foundation Fellow in 2014 and a Carnegie Fellow in 2020. In 2019, she was introduced into the National Women's Hall of Fame. She currently teaches at the University of Kansas, her alma mater, where she holds a joint appointment in Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies and the School of Public Health Affairs and Administration and a courtesy appointment in the School of Law. Justice Deere was born in Silver Springs, Maryland, but was raised in Wichita, Kansas, where she spent her high school years participating in History Day, debate, forensics, theater, and volleyball. She currently lives in Lawrence, Kansas, with her husband and two dogs. Her interests include following KU basketball, cross-stitch sewing, and watching documentaries. Welcome, Justice Deere. Hello, thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you for this invitation. Yeah, we, we really, we really appreciate 
you being here and really looking forward to this conversation. You know, and I think just to start us off a little bit, I don't, I don't know about you just this year, but I've been getting a lot of questions recently about what is the correct terminology when talking to about indigenous people? You know, there's many ways to refer to us um, and just wanted to hear from you. How do you use these different terminologies? Sure. So we're talking about things like the word Indian or the phrase Native American or American Indian uh, or First Nations, um, Indigenous. Um, and what I tell my students a lot is that, you know, if you put 10 Native people in the same room together, you're going to get about 20 opinions about the right term. Um, and, and it's a, sometimes a regional preference. So, for example, First Nations is often used in Canada. Um, and some people use it in the United States, but not to the extent they do in Canada. Um, a lot of people are uh, hesitant to use the word Indian. And I think particularly in the time period um, of the 80s and 90s, a lot of us being brought up in liberal arts, um, you know, we're told not to say Indian anymore because it's an inaccurate term. Uh, but I'm trained as an attorney and all of the laws and Supreme Court decisions say Indian. Um, so I'm, it's just kind of rolls off my tongue and sometimes it makes people uncomfortable. Um, but that's how I, you know, sort of default as an attorney. And then um, to the extent I talk about violence, um, I tend to default to native women uh, or native two-spirit people, um, uh, not native American, um, but, but rather just, um, 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 just to say uh, native women and native two-spirit people. So you'll hear me alternate um, throughout my discussion with you all today. Um, and just know that there's not really a right or wrong answer. And the best thing that you can do is to make sure that, uh, or ask somebody, you know, do you have a preference um, in terms of, of labels? It's incredibly complicated. We could do a whole session just on this question. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that's a really good point. We actually had somebody comment on one of our sessions yesterday how, you know, black and brown people using that terminology really it le kind of leaves out indigenous people who might be lighter skinned. And, you know, personally, as, as a native woman who's white, has white passing privilege, and, you know, and also this privilege of, of Yale, I've never experienced discrimination based on the color of my skin. You know, but there's been times I felt tokenized or other times, you know, this indigenous erasure. So just wondering how do you personally navigate, you know, I guess experience of being an indigenous woman, um, you know, with, with privilege as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really important discussion that we need to have. Um, you know, I, I think, um, I'm not sure about medicine, but in um, so, so social justice circles and in my field of uh, gender studies, um, you know, we talk about BIPOC, Black, Indigenous people of color, um, but Indigenous people um, generally in American law um, are not a race of people. We are made up of many different races and, um, you know, people with darker skin are experiencing and have experienced incredible levels of discrimination and hate crimes and, and the like. Someone like me, who is a citizen of a tribal nation, uh, but is passing as white, I've never experienced um, discrimination. I didn't grow up on a reservation. Um, my father was a state court judge, so I had plenty to eat and um, could, could participate in extracurricular activities. Um, so I carry a lot of privilege with me. Nobody would look at me and think Native American, right? Unless I'm wearing, you know, regalia or something like that. Um, and I have to be really mindful of that because I can't speak to what it's like to be the victim of racism. I have that privilege of not knowing that experience. And so when we start talking about questions of rape and uh, race and indigeneity, um, it becomes very complicated. Uh, and um, that's something that I've been mindful of because I think I have been selected as a token because people are more comfortable uh, with the way that I look. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, getting awards from foundations and the like, 
they want a Native American to like diversify their, you know, their 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 audience or their uh, pool of people. Um, but for example, I'm on a, a University of Kansas task force to explore the land acknowledgement quandary, right? Uh, and um, I really wanted to co-chair that um, work with somebody who's grown up on a reservation because they can speak much better to that experience than I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you bring up a lot of really, really good points. And I think, you know, we only have an hour together and we have so, so much to cover. And I think that's a, you know, but I think it is a good way to kind of set the frame. Um, and I think getting back to the, the kind of topic from t today, um, you know, Tarana Burke was our keynote speaker yesterday and she actually mentioned how, um, in, you know, Native people, Native women experience really, you know, the highest rates of sexual violence um, in our country, and that we don't talk about it as a form of erasure. And I guess what I was wondering is, how do you even start talking about this crisis? Well, um, as I'm a survivor of sexual violence, and um, I have studied um, the extent to which violence impacts Native communities. Um, and um, where to start? Well, the hard part about, you know, teaching in this area or activism in this area is that so many people don't know the history, right, mm -hmm. of how tribal nations have experienced oppression over the centuries. And so if you just sort of start with the contemporary problems, um, they're very hard to understand if you don't have that background and know the history. Um, it's because it doesn't make sense unless you know the history, um, particularly the 20th century um, experience. And so it's like when I write a, a law review article or a journal article, it's like always you have to begin with this long sort of recitation of history um, because your readers typically won't have that because mm -hmm. it's not taught in the schools. Um, and unless you take a course in college, if you're a white person, it's likely that your only, only exposure to Native people comes from Disney movies like Pocahontas or stories of Sacagawea. Um, and, um, and so you don't really have the, the, um, the exposure. And I talk to people a lot of time after when I speak and people feel like guilty, especially, you know, white people will feel very guilty um, that they didn't already have this information. But I do think that um, as long as people are making an effort to learn and to read and to find out more that more behind the numbers, um, I think that that history connects to the to the present day quite clearly. And so it's really important to start with that history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So would you mind telling us a little bit what is, what is, I know, I realize, you know, maybe it would be easier if you had a PowerPoint, but what is the data um, as far as Indigenous women experiencing sexual violence and, and you know, MMIW? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, um, we don't have a lot of data on the question of missing and murdered Indigenous women. It's a terribly hard thing to study. Um, in terms of sexual violence and domestic violence, we know a little more because of things like the National Crime Victimization Survey, um, which studies or analyzes data from uh, a sampling of all American citizens um, asking whether someone in the household has been a victim and who committed the crime. And of course that gives us much better data than looking at like the number of arrests made because most survivors never report. So what we know mm -hmm. um, of, of the, the latest data, uh, which is published by the federal government, um, the National Institute of Justice, there's a report that came out in 2016 uh, by Andro, uh, Andre Rosé, uh, who's a statistician in Alaska. And he crunched the numbers from the National Crime Victimization Survey and extrapolated that to the population at large. And what we know from that data is over 84% of Native women uh, report having been a victim of, of physical violence of some sort and over half 
uh, of Native women have experienced sexual violence. 56% of Native women report a history of sexual violence as well. So that tells us that the majority of Native women are going to experience sexual violence or domestic violence in their lifetime. And the question really becomes, um, uh, what do we do about it? And how can we uh, think about this in a way that's going to be helpful? So uh, for example, um, thinking about um, uh, thinking about the, the way in which we talk about these numbers, um, many Native women have told me over the years that they prepare their daughters for what to do when they're raped, not if they're raped, but when. Um, because it's more common than not. And imagine, you know, I know rates are high in other communities of color, definitely, but imagine being a mother or parent, a father, um, a guardian, um, foster parent, uh, preparing someone for sexual violence, just saying it's probably going to happen to you. And so let's talk about what we're going to do when it happens. Yeah. It's really so heartbreaking. Yeah, it really is. And starting these conversations, because we're talking about a generation, you know, generation after generation after generation, we didn't have numbers per se until um, from a national level, that is, until 1999, when the federal government, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, um, released their very first report ever on American Indians and crime. And that was the first time there was any sort of government um, validation of what Native people have been saying for decades. Um, it had to be a, a federal government that acknowledged that. And every federal report um, that has been issued that asks the question of who is being who is experiencing the highest rates of, of violence, um, uh, it, with the exception of, of course, um, black women suffering very high rates. Um, uh, but in addition to that, people who are who identify as a, a member of more than one race definitely mm -hmm. have the highest the highest um, uh, percentage of people who've been raped. But most of the time, the federal data crunching um, doesn't really account for that question. So we're looking at, um, you know, you're native or you're not native. And so that's how we um, understand these numbers. I'm not a statistician. I wish I was. Um, something that I'll do in my, my next life, I think. Um, <laughs> but in order to get Congress to act, in order mm -hmm. to get uh, a state legislature to act, unfortunately, we have to use these numbers. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's frustrating because, um, you know, Native women have been saying these, you know, talking about this for decades, but once the federal government, you know, acknowledges that, oh, it's now suddenly has credibility. So it's like the voices of Native women, particularly those that live on reservations, um, are not typically, you know, feeling like the, 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 their issues are represented. And then you have the problem that statistics are very dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. um, they're very important for all sorts of fields of, of, of uh, all kinds of disciplines. Um, statistics are very helpful in understanding the problem and I'm using it as a, you know, lobby tool to get laws changed, but it's very, very dehumanizing. Um, and that's why when I work on issues, um, I always want to pair the statistical questions or the statistical analysis with the human aspect of it, mm -hmm. with the, you know, the, the face and the story um, of, of people who, who, are, who are not numbers, you know, they're, they're survivors. Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, and, I, and I know I want to, you know, we've kind of talked about you know, how this is such a, a large issue and, and what the data is, but, you know, you kind of mentioned going to the beginning. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how this crisis started. Well, to, to, not to be too hyperbolic, but, um, you know, it, it literally started with Columbus. Um, you know, we have a lot of activism these days around the question of Columbus Day, many places renaming Columbus Day, Indigenous Peoples Day. 
And I think for a lot of folks, you know, from all different backgrounds have recognized that um, celebrating Columbus Day is um, erasing um, the experience of native people. So he's um, sort of become this icon of imperialism and colonialism and people want to reject that and reclaim uh, indigeneity as the focus. But there was literal sexual assault happening committed by um, some of the shipmates of Columbus. There was one man on the second voyage who actually had a journal and in that journal he bragged about getting, before he even got off the boat, he saw a native woman and he decided that he was going to rape her um, and he did. Uh, and that is um, in, you know, he put it in his own journal. So clearly he didn't think that there was anything shameful or wrong about what he did. Um, so literally uh, 1492, 1495 is when we start to see um, that history develop, which is sort of we're going to claim the land as Europeans because, you know, we're Christian nations and we have the more right to the land than the quote unquote savages. Um, but they're also looking at I have I have the right to this land and I have the right to the women of this land. Yeah. yeah. And 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 prior to the arrival of Europeans in, in um, colonization, what, you know, at the risk, I guess, of generalizing, you know, we know that there are so many tribes in, in the United States, um, you, you know, many, many more people, you know, prior to colonization, but still, you know, over 570 federally recognized, many more straight state recognized and lots of tribes who aren't, don't have any recognition. Sure. Um, so at the risk of generalization, what do we know about how indigenous people um, addressed such issues, or even if there were issues um, of sexual violence pre pre colonization. Yeah, that's a question uh, um, and uh, that I've written about a lot, and um, I think it's important that we don't over romanticize. Um, you know what our what our people, our our ancestors, how our ancestors lived. Um, because sexual assault happens in all cultures, right? Um, and I've heard people say over the years, like there was no rape before the white man. I'm not sure I buy that, um, but I think it was significantly less um, than what we're seeing today. And my favorite story to tell about this issue is, um, and I, I discussed this in the book, um, is that, uh, um, the first rape law that was written down. So tribal nations did not have written languages pretty much. They had symbolic language, but not like an alphabet, right? Um, and so, you know, everything was orally passed down. So if there's a law in the community that the, that the you know, leaders of that tribal nation uh, make a decision about what is going to be the expected behavior going forward, it was done orally. It was done in ceremony, it was done in song, it was done in uh, conversations. And so everybody had access to that, that law, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was not in a book, an expensive book in a courtroom. Uh, it was something that everyone in the community would understand and be able to recite. But through assimilation, and my tribe was very assimilated very early on, the Creek Nation, it had a lot of intermarriage. And so people were taking on the traps of sort of the expectations of a civilized society, which is how it was actually framed. And my tribe uh, was the very first, as far as I know, to uh, write down a rape law. Um, and because they didn't have a written language at the time, this was 1824, which is, um, about 20 years before we had a written language of Muskogee. So it was in English in 1824. A lot of people were bilingual because they had Scottish parents and Indian parents. Um, but this rape law uh, says that um, the victim has the final say in assessing what needs to happen going forward. Um, and it's interesting because the rest of those laws that we wrote down in 1824 uh, were very much sort of just copy and paste from, you know, state statutes or federal expectations. Uh, but you certainly would not have seen within the state, uh, state governments any mention of a victim 
uh, having the agency and the power and and the expectation of power, uh, you know, to to thrive in the aftermath of a crime by making a final uh, decision about what happens going forward. Um, and so those kinds of findings that I actually found that in law school, which is like 25 years ago, um, but uh, you know, those kinds of things suggest that there was more gender egalitarianism going on within tribal communities, mm -hmm. that we didn't operate as patriarchies um, per se, and more egalitarian uh, structures that would have protected um, citizens. And the reason it's, you know, you don't want to romanticize it and say there were never any rape before our colonization. Um, but we also have to really look at that culture clash and how um, under laws of Europe and then early America, you know, women were essentially property. Mm -hmm. And um, it was very difficult for a woman to come forward with sexual assault. But the reason I think we did, another reason I think that we did um, have lesser amount of these kinds of crimes is because I don't think any civilization can sustain itself for very long when over 80% of the people are experiencing violence. I just don't think that's sustainable. Um, it, it's not a way to function as a people when you have that expectation that you're going to be assaulted. So that's one other reason why I think, you know, we've been on this continent for um, you know, well over 10,000 years. And I don't think that 80% um, of, of native people have experienced sexual violence in the past. Um, and so that's why I think the numbers are relatively new in the last, like I said, like 500 mm -hmm. years. Um, but yeah, I just don't think a civilization can can thrive or even exist with that level of violence. And so that's why I think that um, these numbers we have are very much connected uh, to federal Indian law and sort of the story of how Native people um, are, uh, are described in the law and the expectations around that. Um, so I think we did have um, much less of a problem traditionally going back, you know, historically. Right, right. Yeah, I think centering on, on the victim, maybe we could take it, you know, take a piece of that in, into our present day sure. um, legislation, but also wondering, you know, who, who are the perpetrators? You know, what is the difficulty in, in, um, with tribal law and the intersection of, of federal law? Sure, um, I'm really, really glad you asked that question. Um, so one of the things we have to talk about is um, um, sort of how these, um, I'm sorry, can you repeat that, that last question? So the first part, I think I, I was like two questions to, to yeah, one, yeah. but I think the first question was who, who are the perpetrators? Oh, yes, of course. So this is a really controversial issue, but all of the federal data that looks nationally, it's it, we don't really have region to region data or state by state data, um, but under the national um, understanding of this problem based on the victimization surveys, surveys that America in general, Native people are much more likely to be uh, victimized by someone who's not native. And that's an anomaly in American criminology. Um, statistically, uh, crime is what we would call in typical inter interpersonal violence is called um, intra-racial, right? So if you're a white victim, your perpetrator is more likely than not to also be white. Um, if you're if you're a black victim, your perpetrator is statistically more likely to be black, uh, and so on and so forth. And the only exception to that general rule is um, Native people, both women and men, who report over 90% of their perpetrators are non-Native. Okay, and so the problem with that data again is that it doesn't account for regional differences. So there are some tribal communities where there are more non-native people living on the reservation than there are native people. And so when you see that, you can kind of understand um, how that might happen. 
but then there's more isolated villages or rancherias or reservations where very few non-native people reside there. Um, and so when I pre present these statistics to communities like that, they say, you know, really most of our perpetrators are, are native. Um, and so it's difficult to claim that this is, you know, this is representative of all cultures. Um, and um, I think that one of the reasons that we have to talk about that is because tribal nations do not have criminal authority over non-natives, uh, with one exception, which is domestic violence. And that didn't happen until 2013. Um, so those are important questions to, to, to delve into. Um, and I think that if we're going to be really honest with ourselves about this problem, um, you know, we also have to look at the fact that most Native people do not live on reservations, um, such as myself. Um, I'm in Choctaw land right now. I'm sitting on the Choctaw reservation. Um, but uh, most Native people are what we might call urban. Um, and there are a lot of really large communities of Native people stemming from the 1950s when um, the policy of the United States was the melting pot um, approach. And so Native people shouldn't live on reservations, they should have jobs and be in cities. And this whole tribal thing is just kind of antiquated. And that was the official policy of the United States. Um, and, and then we have to look at the census data and the census tells the census data tells us that um, Native women, in particular, are much more likely to be married to somebody who's not of their same race. Um, and so, if we're looking at that non-Indian, the numbers of non-Indian perpetrators against Native women, that's another factor we can look at because if we're talking about domestic violence, and most Native women are married to non-Natives, that helps explain some of that disparity. But what we really need is regional and local data because if we're going to solve the problem. Um, relying too heavily on the national data won't give us the accurate picture we need to make uh, to, to develop reform for a particular community or particular reservation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I think this the second part of my question was, you know, talking a little bit about, you know, I don't know that many people, you know, understand what tribal sovereignty is, mm -hmm. and also the intersection between tribal and federal law when when you're trying to prosecute perpetrators. Sure. Well, sovereignty sounds like a complicated question, but we all know what it is. We just might not use that word. So typically, I, I'm sitting in the state of Oklahoma right now. It's well, that's not probably a good example because there's things going on here that are a little, are a little different. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I uh, live in Kansas and, and so um, I'm not on a reservation. So the criminal justice system is going to act like it would uh, for anyone. But when it comes to tribal governments, um, there's more of a, it's a more complicated question. So sovereignty basically under the law anyway, means that a government has the right to govern itself. It's just the concept that once a government develops, it has the ability to make laws and then be governed by those laws. So we take it for granted in so many other contexts where we're talking about, you know, we don't really even use the word. So the state of Kansas has sovereignty, but we mm -hmm. never use that word in that context because it's kind of taken as a, a given. Um, and uh, but when it comes to tribal nations trying to exercise authority, there are so many intrusions on that authority that tribal sovereignty has been weakened, not by tribes, but by uh, laws and policies of the federal government. Right. Um, and so we really have to understand how um, how sovereignty works in Indian country to understand that the the health disparities and um, the, the, the high suicide rates and those kinds of things. We really have to understand that tribes really have been um, under attack or sovereignty has been under attack. And so we don't have the same power as the state of Kansas to make laws and be governed by them. Uh, tribal nations are significantly uh, um, uh, 
tribal nations suffer from, from laws that tell them they don't have the power um, to do X, Y, or Z. And um, so we don't really see ourselves, we have to constantly fight to justify self-governance. And, um, and, and the way that plays out makes it very dysfunctional because if you can't take control over a problem in your own nation, um, you know, things will proliferate and, and epi epidemics can develop or, or really long um, standing problems that can't be solved because the tribe isn't allowed to do that. So let's say there was a, a non-Native person who, um, you know, committed an act of violence on, on a Native woman on Indigenous land. Mm -hmm. what, what, what role does the tribe have in, in prosecuting that person? Sure. Um, well, um, with the exception of domestic violence, tribal nations can't prosecute non-Indians for any crime. And that, like I said a little bit earlier, that domestic violence exception uh, came through a VAWA amendment in 2013. Uh, the whole thing starts back in 1978, and there was a Supreme Court decision called Oliphant versus Suquamish. And um, that was a case where a tribe, um, through its sovereignty, prosecuted to white men. And it didn't involve sexual violence or domestic violence, but it was kind of a drunken disorderly um, and interfering with the you know, police officers. And these were two white men who lived on the reservation, um, but committed crimes within the context of the, the land base. And uh, so the tribe prosecuted them just like you would prosecute somebody in, you know, community uh, outside Indian country. Um, but these two, two particular white men um, didn't think they should be held accountable by the tribal nations because uh, they, they didn't, uh, uh, while they lived there, they didn't vote in Suquamish elections and they were not eligible for jury, you know, jury duty in Suquamish court. Um, and so they protested the, even the idea that they should be held accountable in tribal court and took it all the way to the US Supreme Court. And that's the case, the 1978 case, Oliphant versus Suquamish. Uh, and the ruling in that, um, in that case the Supreme Court determined that the tribal nation should not have jurisdiction over non-Indians. Um, it's a puzzling decision. It's not based on precedent. It sort of creates its own rules that are inconsistent with uh, past rulings of the Supreme Court. And um, so, so I think that's another explanation of why we have such high rates of interracial crime is because mm -hmm. at least on reservations, tribes are prohibited from prosecuting non-Indians, even for things like murder um, and child sexual abuse. I mean, those crimes being committed on a reservation by a non-Indian person um, cannot be prosecuted by the tribe. Um, so we're working on changing that and going back to the way it was before 1978. Um, and um, there's something else I was gonna add Kind of drew a blank here. Um, oh, I mean, just think about an analogy, right? So I'm sitting in the state of, uh, uh, let's say I'm back in Kansas because Oklahoma is a very complicated issue right now. But let's say I'm sitting in my home off reservation in Kansas, right? And then I cross the border into Kansas City, Missouri, which is another state, and I commit a crime there, right? Um, and it would be really unheard of for me to go into a Missouri courtroom and say, well, I don't vote in Missouri and I don't sit on Missouri juries, so therefore you can't prosecute me, right? The judge would probably you know, throw that out from, from the get-go. It wouldn't make sense. But yet that's what exists in Indian country. Uh, even if you're a white person who owns a business on, that's on the reservation or you have some kind of contract, with the reservation, if you commit a crime of any kind, you know, even things like vandalism or you know, uh, um, you know, less less serious crimes, uh, the tribe cannot prosecute you for that. Um, mm -hmm. So that is, of course, you know, a lot of people think that the non-Indian statistics or the high rate of interracial crimes um, is very closely linked 
to that 1978 decision. Um, and perpetrators, especially very predatory uh, people or very, um, uh, you know, um, serial killers, um, you know, are attracted in some cases to Indian country, you know, they can read the law as well as anyone else. Um, and so uh, it's been an attraction, you know, especially, and also tribes are so rural and remote in some parts of the country that a lot of meth labs are set up uh, on reservations that are very remote and they're non-Indians doing it. Um, and so, you know, along with meth comes, you know, alcohol and, and um, 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 other sorts of maladies and, and native women, they often court native women to become their, their um, distributors. Um, but they select a reservation, not because there's going to be no accountability, because the federal government could conceivably prosecute the crime. Um, but they know it, they know that they, they can get away scot-free from tribal authority. So right. they're attracted to that. Yeah. Yeah, and I know you mentioned the meth labs and, you know, it makes me think of man camps, you know, on our, our pipelines in the Midwest and um, it's just so, it's so unfortunate. How do we think about reckoning this, um, you know, both also want to hear from you, what are our communities doing as well as, you know, from the, the, the state and federal aspects? Yeah, um, well, I mean, I think you have to start with a modicum of understanding that tribal nations should have a right to govern themselves, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that there should be no restrictions uh, on that authority. Um, and so that requires congressional, right, um, yeah. modification uh, because Congress created the laws. And so Congress, you know, is really the only entity that has the power to um, remove um, uh, those restrictions. Um, but I think that there is a, a resistance among lawmakers to um, at least, you know, open up the possibility of non-Indians being um, prosecuted in tribal court. Um, so when you talk to, you know, legislatures, which is something that I do quite often, uh, you really have to make those analogies. Like imagine uh, Congressman X, uh, that there was this kind of crime committed in, in your, um, in, the, in the area that you represent, and that that, that community um, would not be allowed to prosecute that person. And if you frame it in those ways, you sometimes will get a better reaction. Um, oh, okay, now mm -hmm. that does actually doesn't make sense, you know. Um, but I think the other resistance to make doing this reform um, is the, you know, there's just the stereotypes, especially among older male, you know, congressmen um, that, uh, you know, most of what they learned about Native people came from watching Westerns growing up. And, you know, that, that was a very, very, uh, very common um, uh, genre of movies that, that these men would have been exposed to. Um, so you have to do that education and maybe in some places inviting lawmakers to spend a day on the reservation uh, to learn more about how it works. Um, and there was something, let's see, there was something else I was gonna say. Oh, so so I think it's also important that one of the other challenges that um, that tribes face is, okay, um, Congress screwed this up for as long as they have um, and going back and begging for change is sort of like, why would we go to the source of the problem to solve the problem? is feedback that some people have. They'd rather work within their own communities to develop laws and policies that make sense within the community rather than spending that energy dealing with an entity that created the problem in the first place. So there is no consensus, I can't say, you know, in terms of the, 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 the strategy of addressing mm -hmm. the jurisdictional um, vacancies. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, you know, I, I understand that you were an advocate before, you know, uh, I think maybe even a rape, rape crisis counselor mm. um, before you became a lawyer. So you've been doing this work a very long time. Yeah. And 
wondering what continues to motivate you and how do you continue on with all of this kind of overwhelming trauma? Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, survivors deal with trauma in, in a lot of different ways and some of them are healthy coping mechanisms and some are not. Um, and so one of the things that I really um, do for my own self is um, intellectualize the problem, right? Make mm -hmm. it part of my academic career. And that gives me a little like kind of cushion between trauma, my own trauma and um, working on these issues. And so sometimes, you know, I've had folks come up and to me and say, wow, you seem so like serious, like this, you know, almost isn't like it's a clinical issue, not a, <clears throat> a trauma issue. Um, but I think that's a healthy way to deal with trauma. You know, there's a lot of unhealthy ways to deal with trauma. Um, and I think that, you know, being cerebral about it is not necessarily a bad way to deal with it. But that's kind of what I do is I want to I want to understand it. I want to study it. And um, and some people can't do that. You know, it's it's not a way that they feel um, that they can resolve their own issues of trauma. Um, but that's sort of been my path is to is to say, if I can understand this, if I can read enough or study enough or um, participate in, in a variety of different efforts to address this, this crisis, um, then uh, that is sort of my victory, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's how I cope with it, but many people don't you know, cope with it that way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of people in the audience are working in, in mental health in some way, mm -hmm. um, whether the patients, advocates, and some people are, are, are you know, many people are, are patients themselves. And is there something that you would like people to take away from this discussion when they think about Indigenous women and in the, in the violence that, mm -hmm. you know, they experience? Yeah, I, I think being, um, you know, I'm also a patient. Um, I struggle with bipolar two disorder. And so I, what, I, um, what I would offer to the audiences is that, you know, there's not going to be a, a, a sort of monolithic or um, general, like every tribe is distinct. You know, there's over, like you said, there's over 570 tribes with completely different cultures and languages and traditions and histories. And you can't sort of group us all together because it doesn't, it doesn't account for different difference. Um, um, and so in terms of, of working with native survivors or native mental health patients, um, you know, I think don't start off with just asking a lot of details about the tribe, you know, once you know where someone is, is from or where they grew up or what tribal um, citizenship they have, um, you know, kind of try to educate yourself about that history. Um, you're not going to learn everything from books, but um, being uh, thoughtful about how, understanding how that history impacts, um, impacts an individual patient uh, you know, the other thing we have to talk about is generational trauma. So mm -hmm. um, as a survivor, you might know that your mother was assaulted and your grandmother was assaulted and your great, 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 great grandmother was assaulted. Um, and each generation sort of, bear, you know, the burden becomes more onerous as time goes by. And so understanding intergenerational inter trauma, also called historical trauma, there's a lot of different names um, that uh, psychologists who study this issue have uh, used, but the idea that you carry the burden of your uh, ancestors um, in, in addition to your current mental health crisis or um, uh, whatever um, is, is something really important for caregivers to understand. Uh, and it's okay to say, I don't know. And it's okay to tell a survivor who maybe is talking about a complicated issue with the jurisdiction, um, you know, uh, tell me more about that. I, I don't have as much education as I should about this issue, but if I can understand the scope of, of what your trauma has been, I can provide better um, uh, um, treatment for you mm -hmm. in the aftermath of trauma like this. Yeah, I think that, you know, thank you so much for sharing your own personal 
you know, even briefly sharing your personal experience. I think it's really, especially for our, uh, you know, some of our students who are here, I think they probably really appreciate hearing, you know, your, your mental health and and how successful you are and how big of an impact you've been to our communities, right? You know, you, your advocacy work and your involvement in tribal law um, at the federal level as well has been so impactful. And, you know, we really, really thank you for that. Yeah, I I tried to talk to students about that because especially people going into professional degrees, you know, I feel like disclosure of mental health challenges can be um, very scary. And I'm not going to try to tell anyone that there's not stigma attached to a diagnosis like bipolar disorder. But, um, you know, the medication when I'm on the right medication um, allows me to, to really do anything that I want. And so what I would tell anyone out there who's struggling, um, with mental illness is that you can, you can do this, um, you know, through talk therapy and medication, I've been able to go from, you know, a 19 year old binge drinker cutter to, you know, MacArthur fellow in less than 30 years. So don't give up on yourself. You know, there are, there is treatment out there and, um, it's not shameful to, to try to access, uh, that, that care and that, um, that treatment that will make a difference. Thank you for saying that. It's really, really powerful. Um, I realize that we're getting close to time. And so I want to make sure that we take a question or two from the audience, um, this is one from uh, Ty Fierce. How do you balance clicktivism, scrolling culture with the actual groundwork? Um, does, does, that, does that make sense? No. <laughs> okay. In my opinion, this question isn't worded well, but the bigger issue among all things that are promised to bring change to native country with regarding, I think kind of, you know, maybe this, you know, the, missing and murdered indigenous women, right? We see it maybe on an article in the New York Times, but then it's only there for a day or so. Right. So how do we continue to push these issues when maybe popular culture is only interested in for a moment? Right, right. Well, I'm really indebted, I think, to filmmakers these days um, mm-hmm. because what um, a documentary, I've been interviewed for a few documentaries. The one that I would recommend um, is Sisters Rising. Um, which I think you can find if you Google Sisters Rising documentary, um, you can find it. And and so we're reaching especially more college students about these issues um, because people have screenings and Q&As and things like that. So um, um, sustaining interest in the issue through documentary or through some novel could delve into some of this. I would highly recommend Louise Erdrich's book, uh, The Roundhouse which is a novel that I assigned to my law students um, because it explains the law of uh, rape in Indian country better than any law book that I'm familiar with. So through fiction, documentaries, awareness events, um, trying to be visible, right, to to the outside world is complicated. And again, some people would rather spend that energy working inward uh, and then some of us work in an outward. Uh, way. Mm -hmm. So there's not a right or wrong um, answer to that question. Yeah. Just a quick plug, Louise Eller, she has her own bookstore in uh, Minnesota called Birchwood Books. If you want to support indigenous indigenous companies, uh, she's a beautiful writer um, and they do ship. I just got her new book. Um, This is one from uh, a Maroni, sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. How can IHS better serve victims? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? How can Indian Health Service better serve victims? Oh, that's an excellent question. Well, the the problem with Indian Health Service, um, the challenges that Indian Health Services struggle with are, are, are massive underfunding. Um, you know, we, I think that the uh, U.S. Commission on Civil Rights estimates that um, IHS or Indian Health Service um, receives about 40% of a budget that they need um, to actually uh, create um, a a place where people can receive treatment um, and and sustain that treatment. It's also very hard to hire, I think, because a lot of these uh, 
uh, positions are in very, very remote areas with little access to, um, you know, uh, shopping or um, housing um, to, to, mm -hmm. to make that decision to take that kind of um, position in, we're in IHS. Uh, and I think, like I said, I don't want to just blame it on funding. There's a lot of structural barriers there too. Um, you know, the complication between whether a federal employee, and that's what IHS officials or our employees are federal, they're federally uh, funded, is to, to cr critique your funder. Um, and to say, you know, I want my job and I want to do this right, but um, the federal government holds the purse strings. And so mm -hmm. um, my, my hope is that more and more tribes through economic development can open their own healthcare facilities. That may seem like a pipe dream for some reservations, but um, for example, if a wealthier tribe, say in Southern California, that has a lot of revenue through gaming, they, they build their own health facilities and fund it mm -hmm. themselves and they get the best and most, um, you know, cutting edge equipment. And um, so that draws physicians to, to that particular community. Unfortunately, we can't say the same for rural communities where there's uh, unrelenting poverty. Um, but that's what I would like to see is IHS, you know, continue to support the tribes that need it, but we really need to press Congress to fund IHS just even at the basic level, there just isn't mm -hmm. the funding to hire psychiatrists, sometimes mm -hmm. reservations. The only mental health care that is available is crisis mental health care. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're not getting therapy. You're not necessarily getting uh, um, uh, group therapy. Um, and so you have to wait until you're in truly in crisis to get to get help. And as a result, the suicide rates are very, very high. Very high, very high. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we're, we're just about out of time, Justice Deer. And, you know, I really, really like, like I mentioned, appreciate you coming here today and, and talking with us and, you know, helping us think through why, why this is an issue and how can we improve this? And, you know, I, you know, Padamayado, Migwetch, uh, and I, I hope you enjoy the rest of your vacation. We appreciate you taking your time, your vacation to be with us. Absolutely. I'm, th I'm very honored to have been asked as a non-physician, as a lawyer, to speak uh, to folks who work in mental health. I think typically it should be the other way around. I think that lawyers should be listening more to, uh, to healthcare providers than they do. So it's kind of ironic that, that I provided this time, but um, I do think that lawyers need to sometimes be quiet and listen to people who provide support um, to people in Indian country. Well, thank you so much, Justice Deer, for everything that you do and for also educating us on this really, really important topic. Um, and also in the spirit of thinking about how helpers, you know, we're all helpers, you are as well. And um, I'm really grateful that you talked about how you also take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also one thing that when we were building this conference, we wanted to be mindful of if there's ways that we can help the helpers and offer things that can be um, soothing to people. Um, so I just also wanted to put up the, uh, the in-kind supporter gift that is paired with this um, talk. So, uh, we were coordinating with some mental wellness companies and this company calls Aura, um, which is a mindful app, mindfulness app that helps uh, promote better sleep, stress and relaxation through guide, guided mindfulness meditations is offering a free month to everybody who comes to the session. Um, you just have to go to AuraHealth.io slash redeem and then put in the code Yale Women's Mental Health Conf, C-O-N-F 2021. Um, and I can try to post this elsewhere too if people are interested. But again, thank you so much for everything that you do. Sorry if people heard me sniffling in the background because <laughs> I'm sitting next to Steph and I got a little emotional. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you. If people want to reach out to me, I'm at the University of Kansas. Um, and so you can find me there, my email and contact information. I'm working from home, so there's not a good phone number, but you can certainly email me. Great. Thank you. And see you all later. All right.